On this episode of AvTalk, the raccoon returns, the FAA is keeping Virgin Galactic grounded, and the list of places the Max can fly gets longer. Hello and welcome to episode 128 of AvTalk. I am Ian Pechnik here as always with Jason Urbanowitz. Hello, Ian. How are you? Hello, Jason. I'm doing well. How are you, sir? I'm great. Thanks for asking. I I'm happy to to know that you're doing great. That yeah. uh, One, I would say is an improvement over last week's episode when I think we were dragging each other across the finish line. Yes, you know, one week closer to getting back on an aeroplane out to LA where we get to see people and friends. And each other. Yeah. Wow. So yes, some each other for the for the first time in a few months and, and then uh, friends for the first time in oh, who knows how long. I don't know how long. But it's been uh, many, many months and I am looking very very much looking forward to it. And I'm especially looking forward to recording today because I am excited. One of the stories that we have been following uh, since March of 2020 has finally, uh, we'll say, come come to a head, and the raccoon has returned. Ah, which raccoon? Be more specific. <laughs> oh dear, Mr. Porter is back. Hey, finally. I like Mr. Porter. Good for him. He was in hibernation for 18 months, was it? Yeah, and and who had any idea that, that raccoons could hibernate that long? I guess we found out, but only if they're as, you know, well-traveled and, and experienced as Mr. Porter. And and I don't think any other raccoons are. So, th- this is very good news uh, as far as the the general return to, to travel is concerned. Porter Airlines, which is the uh, currently – all Dash 8 airline, soon to be the Dash 8 E2 airline. They are back in action. They took off from Toronto's Billy Bishop Airport today, which is the the island airport in Toronto, close to the downtown area. And they have restarted their Canadian routes today. And then on the 17th, so next Friday, I believe, is when they will return to limited US service. So good for them. But yeah. Yeah. Air Canada tried to steal their thunder. They they did. They did. So Porter started up today with a modest 24 flights, not not that huge. It'll ramp up to 34 in the middle of next week and then once they launch US services again, they they ramp all the way up to 61 flights. But Air Canada wasn't really willing to let Mr. Porter just kind of run away with the show and they announced just what like three or four days ago, me too, that they will also start very suspiciously on the same day that Porter was restarting, that Air Canada would also start services from Billy Bishop, uh, Toronto City Airport. Not many flights. It's like four a day to Montreal, at least right now, but um, definitely tried to steal some thunder there. Yeah, but but it, good news all around, and and we'll take what we can get. Air Canada Rouge is also back after, I believe, their latest eight-month pause. So they are they are back to flying Air Canada Rouge, being Air Canada's uh, lower cost, fewer frills, leisure airline for Canadian leisure travelers. Uh, And so a a a good way to start the podcast with uh, welcoming our, I think, our both yours and mine are our favorite airline mascot back to the skies. Yeah. I mean, I only have two really preferred airline mascots, one being Mr. Porter, the other being Sir Turtle. But Mr. Porter is definitely at the top of the ranking there. It's it's not a long list, but it's uh, it's an auspicious one. Mm -hmm. How is uh, Sir Turtle doing these days? You would have to ask him. Ah. Indeed. (laughs) I don't I don't really know how to to get out of this hole that we've dug ourselves in with the Let's raccoons. Just so I'm, move just, on. I'm just gonna jump out. So we go from from cartoon raccoons to cartoon human beings and uh, Sir Richard Branson and Virgin Galactic's flight that took place in late July is currently under investigation by the Federal Aviation Administration for straying outside of its airspace window. 
So for all of these launches, whether they be to space, to near space, to somewhere up uh, wherever they are, the FAA provides a, a safety window that says, "Okay, you're gonna you're gonna go up, and here is your your area, both in terms of uh, kind of ground space, a, a 2D box on the ground, but also a, a 3D into space." And as they were powering up their their rocket motor to to climb into space after release from their mothership, they encountered a warning light that said, you're off course. The flight continued and and as they were returning to the, the spaceport there, they strayed outside of the FAA safety area for almost two minutes. And the way that that area works is that there's basically a a point in space at which they have to to hit so that they can make it back to the spaceport because they're they're gliding back down similar to the to the space shuttle and and so there's there's a lot of manual flying and there's the the glide back down the FAA is investigating why how and how to prevent any future straying outside of the safety zone yeah, the there's an article from the New Yorker of all places that goes into pretty detailed look into what exactly happened here, and it says uh, they strayed outside of their designated airspace for a little under two minutes of the 15 minute flight, uh, one minute and 41 seconds of the 15 minute flight. But oddly, Virgin Galactic, it seems like they didn't notify the FAA that that happened. And apparently, they're, they're very sorry that they did not self-report that. And they are working with the FAA to update procedures for alerting the FAA in the future. Okay. <laughs> the New Yorker article also gets into the fact that one of Virgin Virgin Galactic's flight test, uh, pretty much their, their lead person as far as flight test is concerned – was fired. And I haven't read enough about that to to continue to talk about that portion of the uh, the, the that aspect of the story uh, as far as this podcast is concerned. But it's one of the things that I found very interesting about the New York article, which we'll link to in, in the show notes, because I, I think it's worth taking a look and reading a little bit more about what's going on there. The FAA says that until their investigation is complete and they are satisfied that there are no no additional safety issues, the VSS Unity will remain grounded. Virgin Galactic had hoped to fly, I believe, the end of September, beginning of October uh, on its next mission to space, and it doesn't look like that will happen, barring any surprise conclusions to the FAA investigation, which are not known for their brevity. No, no, they are not. So I guess we'll just stay tuned and see what happens in the exciting world of commercial space travel. Indeed. Philippine Airlines has declared Chapter 11 bankruptcy. They've been in kind of restructuring mode for oh, ever, ever, but, but in, in earnest for months now. There's been talk for the past year or so about the airline getting rid of aircraft, delaying new deliveries. And with the Chapter 11 filing, that seems to have come to fruition. The airline will get rid of 22 planes. And Jason has the details on which ones. Yeah, it's either 21 or 22, depending on, on who you ask. But Apparently, this comes from Aviation Week. It's going to shed four of its six A350s and four of its 10 777s. It's a very odd number that it would leave it with just two A350s. That's about enough for one ultra long haul route that it was currently, uh, that it was previously doing before COVID. Uh, if it was still intended to fly to JFK, it needs two aircraft to run a daily flight. So that's an interesting change, but. Nothing new for Philippine that it, it's just always been in this perpetual state of reorganization. Way back when it was a premium airline, uh, maybe about a decade ago, it shifted to a low cost airline with a quite a low end product. And then again, management changed out and it went to a, a premium brand with these nonstop flights to JFK and A350s and nice interiors. And now we're kind of shedding those nice aircraft again. So 
I guess we'll wait and see to see what this iteration of, of PAL becomes. Premium low cost. Oh, that's I don't not know. a bad combo. I I mean, <laughs> I would take it. Yeah. In, in addition to the 22 aircraft that Philippine will be getting rid of, they're also delaying 13 Airbus A320 Neo family aircraft. So when they say family, I'm assuming that that's, they're going to delay A320 and A321s as well. Uh, so that'll be interesting to see how long they're delayed, along with uh, deliveries from a lot of other airlines that, that are delaying their uh, their deliveries as well. Yeah. Th- this poor airline just can't uh, figure out what it wants to be when it grows up. <laughs> Maybe one day. Speaking of A320 family aircraft, this was an interesting one that I did not really expect. Lufthansa Cargo is going to pick up two Airbus A321 P to F conversions. So the passenger to freighter, these are the full conversions that contain the ULD enabling uh, cargo, the large cargo door. So cut them in the side and, and add a new door and all that good fun stuff. And those two aircraft will be stationed in Frankfurt and operated on behalf of Lufthansa Cargo by Lufthansa City Line. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. I feel like anytime Lufthansa wants to do something a little out there or a little different, they just say, oh, we'll get CityLine to operate it. <laughs> I mean, even in, even in cargo, you, you would think that a freighter would be operated by their dedicated cargo brand, Lufthansa Cargo. No, it will be operated by Lufthansa CityLine on behalf of Lufthansa Cargo. It's just like when they did the A340-300 low cost long haul operation. It was just a, a run of the mill Lufthansa A340, but operated by City Line. And here we are again with a freighter operated by City Line. It's just very strange. Was, wasn't there the didn't you take that one flight that was from was it San Jose or yes, to Frankfurt it was or something Frank, like that? Frankfurt to San Jose, because apparently that's where the tourists wanted to go was San Jose, California. Uh, needless to say, that flight did not last long. But but it wasn't a tourist flight, wasn't wasn't it geared towards people that were working in tech and they were trying to to make not this according like to Lufthansa. Thing? Uh, according really? to Lufthansa, the business passengers would fly out of SFO on their premium aircraft, the, I think the A three eighty at the time, and tourists would want to fly to San Jose for some reason. I think they had it backwards. I I, I don't know what was going on there, but needless to say. The 34300 city line operation to San Jose did not last long. I don't even remember them closing it down. I think they were just like, okay, we're done with this. Forget just, it. Yeah, it just the plane took off one day and they never came back. Yeah. That's <laughs> it's just well, whatever. Back to the 321. They say it can yeah. transport 28 tons per flight, significantly larger cargo volumes than the short haul bellies of passenger aircraft. It will be stationed in Frankfurt because, of course, it will have a range of 3,500 kilometers. So yeah. that's cool. This follows along and. I bring this up because it's one of the interesting threads that we've been pulling on throughout. The, the pandemic especially, but over the last couple of years generally, is that these are are really operated on the back of e-commerce. So this is not, you know, this the, these are commercial consumer freighters, basically. All of the stuff that these aircraft are going to be carrying are going to someone's house. And as that kind of increases, we've talked about Amazon operating narrow body freighters, or not Amazon operating, but Amazon contracting narrow body freighters for like Sun, uh, from Sun Country, for instance, in the US. You've got uh, smaller aircraft carrying those ordered on one day or two day delivery type things. And, and this, I mean, to me makes perfect sense that Lufthansa cargo would want to get uh, get something where they can add to their kind of instantaneous capacity where they're, they're making sure that something gets, you know, there as, as soon as possible. So they're not waiting for those, I guess, um, fewer frequency, but, but larger volume freighters. Yeah, I guess if it's something that makes sense and Lufthansa clearly thinks it does, uh, they're going to do it. I think it makes perfect sense and and I I can see this happening among additional airlines and and making sense as well. 
We also get to mention the CEO of Lufthansa Cargo, Dorothea von Boxberg, and I cannot believe um, that you were just waiting to mention that we don't work more Lufthansa Cargo uh, stories into this podcast because I just absolutely love that the head of CEO, uh, head of Lufthansa Cargo, is named von Boxberg. Do you do you feel better having mentioned that? I do feel better. And Jason, I turn the rest of the podcast over to you. (laughs) Okay, we're done. Well, we also have, I think we didn't mention this last time, Air Wisconsin rolled out its first of, I don't know how many, CRJ200 converted freighters. And it looks good. I don't know if this is a retro livery for Air Wisconsin. I'm not too familiar with its past, but it's nice. It's got the orange and green sheet lines, cargo on the tail. It's dare I say, one of the nicest looking CRJ 200s out there, specifically because they're not putting any passengers in it. Well, I mean, it, it's certainly not a high bar to clear as, as no. far as a good looking CRJ 200. But but to answer your, your ponderance, uh, yes, it is a retro livery. That was their kind of a darker shade of U-Haul, I guess, is a good way to uh, to describe their their color patterns or color scheme, and it does look good. We will put a link to that in the show notes. I don't know when that one is going to be first operational. Uh, no, but it will but be interesting to track it when it uh, when it is. Yeah, if you want to track that, it's November four nine eight Alpha Whiskey. Uh, I don't have any information about the the specs of the aircraft because the Air Wisconsin website doesn't even acknowledge its existence. But they call it the the large cargo door CRJ two hundred SF. But as far as payload or range, I don't see any information. But they say they are still working on the logistics. They're in the process of bringing the cargo aircraft into their operating certificate in the coming months. So it won't be in service just yet. It is some good eye candy at the moment. If yeah, they even painted the winglets. It's nice. And and that's uh, that's the kind of attention to detail that we've come to appreciate. Yeah, and I won't have to get inside it unless I want to. <laughs> well, you, you would need to ship yourself somewhere. Let us take a quick break and then we'll come back and we will package a bunch of Boeing stuff all together. We'll talk about a used 737 that has had quite the ride and we'll talk about what we're going to get up to over the next couple of weeks and hopefully some of our fine listeners can join us as we do it. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back, and it is now time for all of the Boeing news you didn't know you needed. Oh, where do we begin? We begin in Malaysia, and then we hop over to Singapore because both of those places have lifted their grounding of the 737 MAX aircraft. So we are are slowly approaching all major MAX operator locations allowing the 737 MAX to operate in their airspace. Barring a, a few, Russia still has not said it's okay. And China being the the major holdout, still having uh, left its approval on the table, I guess, so to speak. Yeah. I wonder when Russia is, is going to go the other way on that one, since there are Russian airlines that have the MAX and they, they, they don't seem to be in quite the bargaining position that China is, since there are so many Macs that are going to China and there's a whole political backstory we don't need to go into there. But I wonder what's holding Russia back from recertifying the Macs and when that will happen. Those are very good questions to which I do not have answers. I've just seen nothing, nothing. out of Russia. On that. Yeah. I mean, Less than nothing. China. Yeah, I mean, it, there's been nothing as far as I as far as I've seen about whether or when or what the process is going to be. China has at least mentioned in passing, really, what the requirements are going to be as far as getting the aircraft back up in the air, and they don't really have much to do with the airplane uh, necessarily, but they're at least known. With Russia, I, I don't think we have any of that information. I feel like at some point, those Maxes are just going to somehow become a, like a C919 or something or, or a super jet overnight. And no one will know how it happened. <laughs> or, or what's the other, not a C919, what's the uh, the Russian wide body that they're developing? The 929. 929, that's it. Well, that, yeah, that's no. the Russian China one. 
that actually that that's news we can talk about. But the one you're thinking of is the MC21. That's it. Yeah, that one. That program went silent. They had their first fight like years ago, and that I haven't heard a thing. So we we actually talked about it on the podcast that you don't listen to. What so podcast? This podcast. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, a few months ago, they're in flight testing. The MC uh, MC twenty one programs in flight testing. They had been using the Western engines. Then a few months ago, they had their first first test flight with the Russian built engines. So now they're you know still moving through the flight test program. But but jumping back to the the nine two nine for for a moment, which is the joint Russia. China wide body aircraft that's in development that this week they said is still on track for a 2025 launch interesting to see if that actually happens and and how many airlines order it but interesting nonetheless that they've they're sticking to their their timeline uh, so so things must be working out for them right and I just put myself on the MC21 media mailing list so anytime there's information coming out about that or I, I guess the Superjet 100, I'll get some information and I won't miss Excellent. it next time. Excellent. And apparently the Yak 152, which is a thing. That's important. Yeah. Ryanair uh, and yeah. Boeing are currently at loggerheads for pricing on a new order of 737-10 MAX aircraft, which is no surprise because Michael O'Leary drives a very, very, very hard bargain and Boeing wants to keep its best customer. So they've decided to, to walk away for the moment. They'll come back. They'll figure out a price. This has been written about breathlessly in the press this week and saying that you know they're they're fighting over the the cost um Reuters latest exclusive is that Michael O'Leary is willing to wait years before they order anything until the price comes down i'm just super impressed with O'Leary's ability to maintain his ability to create news when there really isn't any it gets clicks and that's why people keep writing it up because any, anyone who knows O'Leary knows that this is nonsense. He will order these aircraft tomorrow if the price comes down. And how many times has he threatened over the past the the Airbus Boeing duopoly that he will order a super jet or an MC twenty one in a heartbeat? Look at that. Two mentions for the MC twenty one in one bot one episode. Look Didn't see you. that coming. Look at that. No. But he, he's mentioned that for like a decade at this point that if the Boeing doesn't change their pricing, if Airbus doesn't change their pricing, he'll order some sort of Chinese or Russian aircraft. He's never going to do that. It's all bluffing. And at some point, Boeing will lower their prices or meet some obligation that meets Ryanair's needs and they'll order 4,000 aircraft like usual. Yeah, I, I enjoy the dance. I think it's amusing. I think it's fun to watch. But I also think that it's it's just this weird theater because everyone knows the outcome. It's just watching how they get there. It's that's negotiation via the media, and everyone knows that's how it is. But we continue to do it because it's fun. I guess so. Anyway, they're they're busy having fun. Um, the, I mean, the Boeing's not having fun. <laughs> well, Boeing's not having fun. They're they're feeling better. I mean, the flip side of this is Boeing feels confident enough in the the rebound of the market that they've raised the prices on the max. And so that's, I mean, good news for Boeing in some senses that that they found a price that upsets Michael O'Leary, which is probably good for the rest of the market as far as Boeing's concerned. So to me, that that says more about where Boeing thinks the market is headed than where where Ryanair thinks uh, or where, where Ryanair wants to be. I mean, certainly Boeing will find an acceptable price to continue selling, you know, hundreds and hundreds of airplanes at an order clip to Ryanair. And that'll happen. But the interesting thing to me is is how they're going to get there and and what Boeing thinks they can get from other airlines in, in the meantime. Yeah, yeah. It's uh <laughs> stay tuned. Always. We're always yeah. staying tuned. That's yeah. all we do. Yeah, and I got some breaking news for us right now. Oh, good, good, good. Super interesting. Uh, not really. Frontier Airlines has retired its final Airbus A319 aircraft just today. Wow. 
I didn't even know that was happening. November 949 Foxtrot Romeo delivered to Frontier in 2006. So like four versions of Frontier ago. Operated its (laughs) final flight from Nashville to Denver today. And it is no longer in the business of operating A319 aircraft. Wow. How about that? I didn't even know that was happening. It feels like yesterday, more like eight years ago, that it operated its final A318 flight, which is a lot more noteworthy. Right, right. The the eighteen just it it never really did uh, what anybody wanted. They're to still do. out there. Yeah, some of them. They're still but, out there. Uh, I think Avianca, yeah. maybe, and Air France. Air France, yep. Air, Air France is repainting, uh, repainting theirs. So they're they're going to keep them around for a while. Yeah, but there you go. Frontier Airlines, the final A three nineteen in its fleet, has been retired. Well, you muscling in on my Boeing news. I'm I'm getting back to Boeing. Okay. Yes. So the the 787 saga continues. Oh no. With I I know, but it's it's there's nothing new this time. It's just the Boeing is proposing inspection regime for the 787s to ensure that they are meeting the quality standards that they need to meet. As it turns out, that inspection regime does not pass muster with the FAA. Uh, because Boeing's own employees that are tasked with assisting the FAA in regulating the aircraft had said, no, that's not good enough. So they're kind of going, not necessarily back to the drawing board, but continuing to work out the inspections, how they'll take place, what they'll inspect to ensure that everything works out and they find all of the the defects that they are looking for and the aircraft can then be delivered again. So it, it sounds based on the article from Reuters, it sounds like October could be when it's coming. We'll see if that's true or not. It might be longer than that. But But Boeing's really keen to get these inspected and then out the door again. Is Boeing making any money off its commercial aircraft business right now? I mean, between the Max saga and the 787 not delivering an aircraft for a year, money cannot be coming in too swiftly to that uh, division of Boeing right now. This isn't a video podcast, but just trust that I'm pulling my collar and making a, a grimacing face. Yeah, I don't know. We'll we'll have to wait for the financials to find out. But at least an indication that things are working at the FAA, that the the FAA actually read the plan that Boeing submitted and said, (laughs) no, I don't like this. Please go back and make improvements as opposed to the old FAA that, you know, didn't read their emails, I guess, or anything or didn't care what was going on at Boeing. So this is good. This is good that the the plan, the safety procedures in place are actually working. People are paying attention to the things they should be paying attention to. And well, not so good for Boeing, but good that the FAA is paying attention. Yes. And which is good for Boeing because, you know, in the long run, this increased level of oversight, shall we say, uh, I think will be will be the key to putting Boeing's reputation back in in good graces as well as you know making sure that the, the aircraft that they're building are ready to go. Yeah. When and if the 777X ever delivers at this point, it will be a highly scrutinized aircraft. Indeed. So another aircraft that I want to talk about is a 737-800, the old good old NG. All reliable. Oh, reliable. MSN 42277. Why that aircraft in particular? That is Greater Bay Airlines' first 737, a new airline based out of Hong Kong. It comes to the airline in a very interesting fashion. So it's a former Norwegian 737. It was uh, stored in Norway for a very long time. Uh, at, at the onset of the the pandemic, it flew down to Budapest for some additional storage, and then it left Budapest, went to to Moscow, Oman, and then went down to Guangzhou for refit, painting, all that good fun stuff. Rolled out of the paint shop. Now, Jason, if the aircraft is painted in in, in Guangzhou, where do you think it would go next for a Hong Kong based airline? Uh, Hong Kong. You would think, but you oh. would be wrong. Where did it go? The aircraft went from China to – it made a tech stop in Nur Sultan and then to Hamburg 
Spent a while I in love Hamburg. Hamburg. Hamburg's great. Maybe they went to miniature Winterland. Uh, maybe. Went to. Uh, Spent some time in Hamburg, did a test flight there, and then went back to Nusultan with a tech stop, refueled, and then finally was delivered to Hong Kong. One of those, I'm sure there was a very good reason. We just don't know what it is. And I find that fascinating, the way that airline leasing and fitting and and all of that fun stuff works out. So Look, uh, Hamburg is great. If I were an airplane, I'd want to go to Hamburg every now and then too. <laughs> I'm sure that's exactly why they went. Yep. But yeah, uh, an interesting. We'll put a link to the, in the in the show notes to the tracking for that one. If you are interested in following Greater Bay Airlines, first seven three seven. So that's all the the newsy news that we have. I would, however, like to direct everyone's attention to the Flight Radar Twenty Four YouTube channel. If you enjoy the podcast, not only is the podcast available with the subtitleage and everything like that there as well, but we have a growing collection of wonderful flight videos that, that our colleague Gabriel Lee has put together and continues to work on. Uh, he's got some really cool stuff up. This week he did a, a turn on uh, – last week he did a turn on Singapore Airlines A350 between Copenhagen and Rome, flew down in the premium economy, flew back in the business class and had some fun doing that. So I encourage you to check that out. He's got some really, really great stuff coming up this week. I mean, that week. sounds lovely. It, it was. I have United Economy booked, which is almost the same. Almost. Very close to it. We are sending him uh, to Greenland in a few days, and he's going to basically fly every aircraft in Greenland. Hmm. I want to do that. And put it all on video. Fixed wing, rotary wing, whatever you got, he, he's going to fly it and have a lot of fun doing it. And we'll, So, we'll have a, a bunch of videos late September, early October, uh, kind of following that adventure that he's about to go on there. So, highly suggest you check that out and let us know how uh, how you feel about what, what he's been up to and what you would like to see over there in addition to here on the podcast. As Jason mentioned at the top of the show, we will be in Los Angeles next weekend at the Dorkfest Spot LAX festivities. The main event, the actual Dorkfest is from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Saturday the 18th. If you are in the Los Angeles area, please by all means stop by. It is a free outdoor event filled with lots of plane watching. There will be a raffle. We'll have a few goodies from Flight Radar 24, as well as some subscription giveaways, if that sort of thing interests you. Jason and I will also be there chatting, hanging out, and doing all of the things that one does standing next to landing aircraft. Uh, there will also be some in and out uh, to be had. Which, I will be uh, eating a cheeseburger for the entire duration of the event. Is it going to be the same cheeseburger the whole time, or are you just going to kind of chain cheeseburger? We'll see where the day takes us. I'm intrigued. I am intrigued. And on that culinary note, this has been episode 128 of AvTalk. I am Ian Pechnik here as always with... Jason Urbinowitz. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.